Welcome to Running For Real, a global community with a shared love and curiosity for running. Together we reconnect with the reasons why we love to run and discover ways it helps us become better people. Whether it's the quiet moments of a morning run while the rest of the world still sleeps, or befriending the strangers next to you at the start line of a race. We are here to connect with others who see running as the common thread that weaves our lives together. Come join me, Tina Muir, as I talk with people from all walks of life, united by a love of running. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 378 of the Running For All podcast. As always, thank you for joining me. I'm excited that you are here. And I am so excited about my guest today. I'll be honest, I had heard people talk about him over the years, but I hadn't really got to know him. I looked him up in order, in order to do this episode. I'd also seen he'd been on the Rich Roll podcast recently. Um, but wow, once I dove in, I felt like we were kindred spirits. We had a uh, very, we jump in pretty quick, pretty deep in this conversation, but it was a really important and meaningful. And I think you're going to get a lot out of this pretty quickly. So I just wanted to give you the heads up that we do go into kind of body image dysmorphia. If that is something that could upset you, just maybe have someone around or question whether uh, now is a good time to listen to that. Um, but today I'm very excited to bring Tim Tollefson onto the podcast. Tim has won Havelina 100, the Lavarido Ultra Trail 120K, Ultra Trail Australia 100K, and was the last American male to podium at UTMB. Impressive ultra resume. You're going to hear he was a, a road and um, collegiate athlete before that. But so much more than that is just his honesty and his vulnerability so without any further ado, let's get to this episode with Tim Tollefson. Friends, it is that time of year, the best time of year for runners. We get to enjoy the time as the weather cools, as we can get outside and make the most of working our way through the humid, hot summer, getting to the best part of the year. One thing I want to remind you though, this time of year, often runners forget to remain hydrated. We think, oh, the weather's cooling off. I don't need to think about that anymore. And that's just not true. Regardless of whether you're a heavy sweater, a light sweater, or anywhere in between, you need to make sure your electrolytes are staying well topped up because you are a runner and you are sweating if you're not sure if you're a heavy or a light sweater uh, definitely go use that fuel and hydration planner uh, that I will give you a link to in the show notes it is free by precision you don't have to use precision products to use it I definitely encourage you to go check that out but I want to remind you this time of year we got to continue being on our hydration. It's going to help your body recover. It's typically used by athletes to stay hydrated and recover faster after intense exercise. So if you have a goal race, you don't want to let it slip out of your hands now by not taking care of your hydration when you've done so well all summer. I love the pH 1500, but you may find uh, one of the other strengths works better for you. As a friend of mine, you can use code Tina sent me to get yourself 15% off. That's code Tina sent me. And that applies to the, the hydration that applies to the gels and all the other things that I have talked about and used in my races this year. So go to precisionhydration.com and use code Tina sent me. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For Real podcast. I am very excited that you are here. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So I just talked at you for about five minutes with various things that um, I have been wanting to tell you and, uh, you know, similarities we have, things like that. And I want to get into some kind of tougher topics Um during this episode and our mutual friend Scott Abbott uh, from uh, the California International Marathon had said to uh, or said to me that he felt and I feel a bit weird saying this myself because I'm saying it about myself but I'm going to say it about you <laughs> um, <laughs> but he actually did say it to both of us as awkward as, awkward as I feel to say this 
um, idealistic, thoughtful, and genuine voices in our industry right now, both doing amazing things and creating awareness and impact. So I want to start by telling the audience that that is one of the things that really drew me to want to talk to Tim. Um, I've seen some of the things you have done online, the vulnerability that you have shared that has helped many, many people, uh, a lot of people would have heard you on the Ritual podcast, but just beyond in your own uh, channels and platforms. But I want to roll it back uh, to the beginning first. Do you remember the first time that you felt running was free and empowering and just, yeah, I guess free of expectations and pressures and... um outcomes, I suppose. That must have been a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to dig deep to, to find a memory of that. <laughs> Probably when I first discovered running, honestly, it's, I, mm. I feel like that was the, the true genuine kind of curiosity in, in the domain when I first realized that like I could run more than a mile and, and that would have been grade school. And it was just kind of falling in love with that movement, but it, it very quickly for me did become sort of a vehicle for finding my place of acceptance. So I think the, the mud, the waters got muddied pretty quickly. Um, mm. and that's not to say there haven't been moments of pure joy throughout my career. You know, sure. I, I think that there's, you know, it's both and, but, uh, I think I, the last time it like truly, like I, I just loved running for pure running was when I was a child. Mm, no, I mean, I mean, that's what I was expecting. And, and I have a similar answer from, from my background. Um, when you say it kind of came together quickly where that those things did start to come into effect, was that, being successful early on? Was that wanting to, um, you know, prove to someone what, what are some of the reasons you think that that came into effect so quickly for you if, if it was in grade school or around that time? <laughs> yeah. It, initially it really was, um, sort of a response to experiencing a, a prolonged period of being bullied and, mm. it, you know, and, and that really stemmed from like all the bullying was, um, as it was born out of just my actual presentation in the world, like my aesthetic, they, you know, like most kids, I think when you get bullied, it's about like the way you look. And so there were those early kind of, um, like in implications that, you know, the way you show up in the world is really how you're going to be perceived and accepted into kind of a community or tribe. And, and after a long period of being on the short end of, of, you know, receiving a lot of hurtful and harmful things, I, I was able to display that, like I had some value as a runner and that kind of won the, let's say the bullies over where suddenly I had something to give and I was sort of accepted into kind of the athletic, uh, domain, if you will. And, and in that group were a lot of the people that had been kind of pushing me around. So I think through just achievement, it sort of started kind of highlighting that, Oh, like, this, this kid has something of value that we want. And I think that kind of started to like muddy my view of what running and sport really had at an early age. Mm -hmm. Were you aware of that at the time? No, I, I think I was more aware of, it felt good to no longer be pushed around. Mm -hmm. And it, so it was more a sense of, Hey, this, this thing that I'm like really afraid of, or like that's been hurting is now removed. And, and I don't think I was really cognizant of, you know, like how I removed that, but it was more just like, Hey, it's gone. Like, let's just keep doing this. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it, cause it's so much more pleasant not to be on the receiving end of, of pain. And around that time when you were working your way through this, you kind of became to be accepted in the athletic circles. You were working your way through um, what was the beginning of a running career. Was the act of running itself still able to remain joyful, even if those pressures started to come in? I would say that it was probably for the, like throughout my high school years, Okay. It was still joyful. And, and I think for me, 
it probably like throughout high school is when I started to be introduced a bit more to kind of the greater culture of running at the time. And this would have been the late nineties, um, early two thousands. And, and at that time, I think there was a big kind of overt culture of thin is fast. And, mm-hmm. you know, in, in a lot of the cult classic books or movies or the way athletes and teammates and people in the community would talk openly about things it it started to kind of like really plant seeds in my head that, you know, like to you be accepted or stay, you know, in this tribe, like I needed to conform and, you know, look a certain way or show up a certain way. And I think that it kind of piggybacks or it, it compounded off of the earlier experience of realizing that aesthetically, like how I present myself is a, a big determinant if I will find acceptance. And, and so I think it sort of started to marry with the, the rumors I was hearing in the sport. Um, and mm-hmm. so throughout high school, I'd say there was a lot of joy in running, but then I was much more cognizant of my body in, and, and it started even just with comments that people would say, you know, and it, at that time I was also playing soccer. And so I was a very strong athletic, uh, individual and people would comment on like how strong I was or, you know, like how big my legs were. And I know it was meant out of, you know, it was, it was meant as a compliment, mm-hmm. you know, cause I, I'm, I was muscular, but in my insecure and vulnerable kind of adolescent state, I was taking those as threats to my position as a runner. Like, Oh, they're commenting that I don't look like a runner. You know, they're telling me I'm big, I have big legs. And, and so those things started to kind of like, I think plant seeds that later would sort of start to take deep root in college and beyond. Yes. I had a conversation with, uh, Jared Wood, who's a dear friend of mine a few years ago. And he was saying that, He's at times in his life really felt this pull where he can't really win in terms of society as a whole tells him as a man, you should be muscular, you should have a strong upper body, you should, um, you know, be like Dwayne the Rock Johnson, essentially. Um, and But then as a runner, he gets the messaging of thin is fast, got to get your race weight, and it kind of you, you kind of can't win either way because one way or another, you're not, you're not get, getting into the right mold. Um, and it sounds like you had of, I mean, in many ways you, the, the muscular side was just other people's comments, not necessarily you noticing what other people in society wanted you to be. Um, but it's just, it's interesting that for men or male presenting people, it's very uh, very much two opposite ends of the spectrum for what people tend to comment on. Yeah, it is. So, um, I, it's funny you say about, um, some of the comments and planting seeds, planting seeds is a phrase I use all the time because I really (laughs) think that's a lot of what, what comes up later for us in, you know, in our lives and even seeds we plant today will come affect us in 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, but I, I, similarly, I remember I've shared this story a few times. I remember being on the bus to the national championships and the girl sitting next to me was, uh, she ended up finishing, I don't know, like second or fifth or somewhere around there. She's right at the top. And I remember watching her eat, or I remember eating my pre-race meal on the way to the championship. And she just like picked at her food, barely ate more than a few bites. And then she won. And I remember for a split Uh, like, well, in that moment, I thought, God, that's weird. Like in my brain, it was kind of a mathematic equation of how do you run if you don't eat to run? But then watching her do well, I thought, huh, well, that's weird because she didn't eat much and she did really well. And so that was a seed, I think, in me that was a similar thing of like, oh, fast people, that's how, that's how they do it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and you never know with those memories um, or those moments, like how they're going to come and get you later in life. So you said about your collegiate career. Um, now, I would imagine most of my listeners are not have not been through the collegiate system. So maybe if you could just kind of paint a picture of what being on a college team, a running college team is like in terms of 
it's a uh, kind of almost a pressure cooker. Everyone is, while it can be a team sport, you're still trying to do the best that you can. You're trying to, um, fine tune as many things as possible as a collegiate athlete. There's so much pressure placed on, well, so much of your life is focused around your sport. What other things would you share about that system? For sure. And I think it's also at like that ripe age of you, mm. you're 18 to 22, where you're really just under like finding out a lot about yourself, but the comparison trap is, is massive. You know, you're, you're surrounded by very similar men and women that have similar goals. And it's easy to just fall into that. What you were describing, like, Oh, well this, this girl ended up winning and she did something leading up to it that. So that must've been a reason for why <laughs> she, she did well. And so we draw a lot of, uh, you know, inaccurate conclusions. Mm. And I think with the lack of like really good guidance, it can, uh, allow us to basically write stories in our own head that are not true, but we just start to double down on them feeling as though there is truth to it. And mm. it's definitely like in, in the collegiate system, I think it's, it's really, you're just, you're surrounded by top performers and, you've weeded out a lot of the individuals from the high school scene that are no longer competing. So, and, and I think it gets worse every level you get up higher, like after college, post-collegiate or in the pros, like you're, you're just kind of like going through this fine filter where only a few people remain and it's easy to cherry pick external uh, aesthetics as to why these people might be successful. When in reality, you know, each person has gotten their, with a much different set of circumstances, their genetics are far different. Um, but I think when you do feel as though there's so much pressure to perform, if you're on scholarship, you need to maintain that, you know, they're the universities, you know, they really are depending on you. There's a lot of stories that you can kind of end up telling yourself. And, and it feels like it's, this is your one chance, you know, that it's, you have four years or five years to make something of yourself. And if you don't do it now, you'll never get it again. And, you know, I think it's just, it, it's like, I mean, it's analogous to saying, Hey kids, you need to figure out your major when you're 18 and stick with it. And then you're never going to like, you know, have a change. And uh -huh. like for athletics, we know that there are so, there's so much time for athletes to develop men and women mm. later in life. But we, we kind of like do like, I like the, what you said, there's that pressure cookerness of there's a four year window. This is your chance. It's now or never. And so it's, it kind of like promotes that let's do anything we can to be successful. And it, I, I don't know. I, I feel like in, in running in particular weight is that low hanging mm. fruit that we can mm -hmm. manipulate. So we latch onto it very quickly. And, and yeah, maybe when you and I were in university, it, it was more openly kind of explicit. Like people were talking about unhealthy behaviors and disordered mm -hmm. eating patterns. Mm -hmm. And, and it was, you know, not always, I mean, I wouldn't say it was promoted, but it wasn't frowned upon the way, yes. thankfully, now we are seeing a lot of people mm. outspoken about it and mm -hmm. acknowledging that you don't need to change your body to be successful at sport, you know, through adaptation of taking care of your body, you will be able to perform well at sport. But I think like I connected the dots that, no, I need to change my body to be successful in this sport. And, and then as you start to get little bits of success, you double down because it's like, well, if a little is good, more is better. And, but then there's, there's, especially with our health, there's a major tipping point there. And often by the time you realize what you're doing, it's too late in the sense of like mm -hmm. that state, that, that one kind of state of your life, not that, you know, globally, it doesn't mean that everything is ruined, but it, it can really catch up to you very quickly. <laughs> Thank you to AG1 for sponsoring this episode of the Running Thrill podcast. I have been using AG1 for, well, since 2019, which is coming up on four years now, and it's going to give you those essential nutrients for long lasting benefits. I have been using this for many years and especially right now with a book tour, with all these things I have going on in my life, my AG1 has been a critical piece of taking care of my gut health, giving me focus and energy to help me with healthy aging and my immune health. I love that it is one scoop, 
in uh, some water every morning and it's the first thing I do that's going to give me 75 high quality vitamins, minerals and whole food source nutrients. It's that comprehensive nutrition in one simple scoop. Uh, it is a ritual that I have every morning. I wake up, that's the first thing I do and I know that it takes care of me. So it's so much more than just taking greens as you might hear other things talk about. It's going to give you that comprehensive blend of core health products that are going to work together to fill in your gaps. So for me right now with two young kids and this hectic schedule, I am missing out on some nutrients and this is where I know I'm taking care of myself in that way. So as a friend of mine, you can get a one year free supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 by going to drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. That's drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. It is going to make it so that you have one thing to take. It will take care of you. It'll be there for you. You can take it on the go. We're going to give you that five free travel packs when you go to drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. I've been loving it for years. And those of you who, um, have been signed up for a while would have seen that you've got a goodie recently. Anyone who was uh, an AG1 user when my book came out will know that you got a copy of the book as a gift from AG1 and that just speaks to the kind of people they are. They care, they care about you, they care about me and they care about the world. So go check it out at drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. <laughs> sure and it, I'm, I'm glad you explained that a bit more because it is quite hard to describe the collegiate system when you haven't been through it and and yes as you said things have have changed a little since then and um it's funny when you were saying about you know you have the your four or five years to really make something of yourself like the the song lose yourself is kind of the anthem of <laughs> of every collegiate athlete because it kind of feels like that right you've got mm -hmm. your one shot to get it right uh even though you know in theory you've got four or five years but still it feels so serious and intense um and then and then as you said with the body type like uh you know my listeners know this that it was a, a comment from a coach that sent me down a spiraling path that kind of ultimately led to uh, as I told you before we started recording me quitting the sport, uh, a collegiate coach, but, um, and again, it's those seeds that are planted, right. And how they can, you know, grow over the years. Um, but also the association within the collegiate world that can still be this way and still within the, the high school level, certainly of, um, you know, uh, interchangeably using the words fast and fit um and how they're really many coaches see that there isn't a difference um and i even remember uh being a collegiate uh sorry a, a grad assistant coach in 2012 to 2014 and, and hearing coaches say those words and thinking she's trying, she's given it her everything. You can't say she's not fit, um, just because of the way she looks, but that was the way that things were seen. So, um, anything more you want to say on that piece? Oh, for sure. And I mean, that resonates very deeply where I, and, and these seeds that you're talking about, like they take deep root and then mm -hmm. they start to like, unfortunately flourish into something that strangles your confidence or your self-worth or your ability to be proud of what you're doing because these maladapted seeds are basically kind of like starving you of, mm. of that, you know, kind of self-acceptance. And I've had that even in my pro ultra career where I, despite maybe having the best training block of my life, and I know I am ready for the race, I've been in a situation at a press conference where a journalist or someone will comment on the runner next to me that, man, you look really fit. Yes. And my brain goes back to this, oh, fit means thin. Mm. And they didn't say that about me. And suddenly my <laughs> confidence just tanks. And, mm. and that it, you know, I've been able to work through that a lot better, but it just highlight like, and I remember that even in, in high school and college, like you start pairing those words of like fit equals thin and thin equals fast. And it's, it is not true. Mm. It, you know, they're, they're, I, I really like the saying is like strong is fast. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you want to have a sustainable running career, the only way to do that is through taking care of your body and nourishing it and maintaining strength and stability 
for the demands of what running is going to place on you, which are incredible. Uh, running is not an easy sport, uh, but uh, I, I, I think there's just so much of that. And, and like you said, it, it still does happen where people tend to comment on someone's physical appearance and that has a lot of weight negatively on mm -hmm. someone that's vulnerable. And I, I really try and choose my words carefully where I don't say those types of things. I catch myself because it's so automatic sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I notice someone is looking a certain way and I want to say, but it's like, oh, no, no, like, mm -hmm. okay. Like they're, they are ready because they put in the work. They are ready because they are healthy. They are ready because they're excited about this opportunity, not because how they've shown up aesthetically, like outwardly. Yeah. A few months ago, actually, I was at a race that I ran, um, as, as an elite and the race director, like I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he said, you're looking fit. And that was the first time I had heard that in a long time. And it like brought this flood of memories back to me. And I was, I kind of almost wanted to be like, oh, oh, like, don't use those words to me, please. Like, A, that's triggering. But B, I mean, are we still doing this? Um, so I, it was quite jarring, actually, having been someone who's out of the sport in many ways, definitely not training in the way I used to. Um, but it really, when you step back to think about it, it, it is insane how much we comment on, yeah, people's like physical fitness in terms of their speed for them. Obviously it's dependent on the person based on what we see on the outside. Um, and, and I don't know about you, but for me, when I was running at that top level, one of the things I really wanted was the vein coming down my arm and I never <laughs> got there, but that was something I always was like, that's how I know I'm fit. Yeah. When yep. <laughs> in reality, <laughs> my body was never going to do that. And, uh -huh. um, just trying to get there is what, what killed me. And, and much to what you said, as I, I worked into the professional world, the number on the scale that I was working towards kept getting lower. And every time I got there, it was like, great on to the next number until as from what I've got, you reached a similar point to where I knew I was sabotaging my performance, even, even to the extent, even if I could lie to myself and say it was for my performance, I knew I'd gone past that point and I was sacrificing my performance in order to look, as we said, fit. Um, mm -hmm. so can you share a little bit about that part for you of, of, I think most recreational runners or people listening might think, oh, they're doing this for performance. This is, this is all about performance. That's what elite athletes care about how it can go beyond that point. Yeah. Yeah. There is that close tie with performance for sure. And, but, uh, I think once you get on that, like hamster wheel, it, you can't get off of it where mm -hmm. there's never enough, you know, like if you, if you achieve a certain weight, then there's always going to be a lower weight that you could do. And, or someone could be pressuring you into that. And, I, I think something I've had to remind myself is that like my weight is the least in, like is, is the least interesting thing about me. Like, mm. because for so long I thought validation or value or acceptance was tied to a number on a scale. And once you achieve that, maybe you're going to find, you know, th th all of the things that you were looking for. Um, but you know, recognizing that r numbers do not define your worth, I think is a really imperative thing to kind of, you know, basically just sit with and, mm. And to, to like, if you think about, um, what you were describing, like runners are, you know, may, I, I hate the term race weight. I know that it's, I don't think it's, I, I don't hear it as much anymore, mm -hmm. but growing up, that was always like talked about like race weight, or I would see athletes bring a scale to practice and weigh themselves. Mm -hmm. And once they found their race weight, they knew they were ready. And and, and again, it's like, like sometimes like, two pounds, like I'm two pounds away from my race weight. And you're like, are yeah. you kidding me? That could have been like some salt you ate at dinner last night. Yes. Like <laughs> it held onto the water. Like, <laughs> like the variation day to day is so drastic. <laughs> yeah. But then we like get hung up on this objective measure as if that's the tell all. Mm -hmm. And, and again, I think it's because it's an easy variable to manipulate and we can yeah. objectively see it 
on a scale. So yourself or a coach or uh, an advisor can be like, oh, see, now this is proof that we're ready. And Mm -hmm. the reality is, you know, it it is one metric in a long line or a long list of things that are necessary to perform well. Um, And, and I think it's, that's where it's like when you are in these like pressure cooker situations where you're surrounded by a lot of other maybe elite athletes, it's easy to fall into that comparison trap of, oh, like so-and-so is doing this or achieving this weight. You know, maybe I need to get down or there's those external uh, aesthetics. Like I want that vein down my arm or there, you know, there, I mean, there's so many ways to basically measure. um, And if, if you get down, you know, into a real suffering state there, there are so many just automatic, uh, kind of habits you engage with to, to mm-hmm. do body checks, to see if you feel like you're ready. And, mm-hmm. and you it's, mean like uh, weighing yourself naked because you don't want the extra pound of, of clothing. clothing. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, <sighs> I mean, I, it, it's, it's pretty, it's wild, like, especially when you say, it, but when you're in it, it's yeah. like, it, it's such an anxiety ridden state that you, mm-hmm. you feel like this is a, a threatening kind of life or death thing. And the only way to reassure yourself that something's okay is by engaging in, you know, maybe that behavior to kind of calm the anxiety. Um, and I think it just in the general, like, you know, running public, it has an effect also where, you know, I think things trickle down from the top and like, we start to kind of idolize or look at other runners and think, Oh, she is fast because she looks this way or he mm. is fast because, you know, he's X. And I think it, it just really has a, a reciprocal kind of trickle down effect onto the masses and everybody involved in the sport. And, and like you were mentioning earlier, you know, you watch any major marathon or track race, it, it's not uncommon to have commentators commenting on the body of the athlete and yeah. like, you know, and, and it's like that, that has no implication of whether they're ready to perform or what they're mm-hmm. doing. But it's, I think it's an easy thing for us as a society to latch onto and, and breaking that, you know, generation old diatribe, like thin is acceptable or thin is worthy or thin is, you know, celebrated. I think it, it's takes, those are seeds that are deeply planted mm-hmm. in our, in the fra- fabric of our entire society. Mm-hmm. So it's like bigger, bigger thing. Yeah. And, and, and the, the speaking to aesthetics is obviously something that we as a society do in general, actually to to take a little side tangent, I told you about being, um, on the today show yesterday and, uh, they made, uh, they didn't make us, but they strongly encouraged. We put, uh, uh, they wanted to put some makeup on and I don't wear makeup ever. Like I haven't put anything on my face in probably at least three years, if not four. And so they insisted on a few things, just some powder and some mascara. So I was like, fine, whatever. But then being in that room and hearing everyone come up to me and be like, you look beautiful, you look beautiful. And I wanted to like be like, why Why is this what we're saying to each other? Like, I, I just, I don't know, it's something that made me deeply uncomfortable because I was like, shouldn't we be saying like, I'm excited for you or like, this is going to be so fun or what a day or anything. Um, but it's just something that's so ingrained in our society to comment on the way that we all look. And so no wonder we're always judging ourselves um, when that's what is constantly brought up. Um and of course, the running world is easily allows that to happen with the, um, you know, the space that these commentators have between interesting things that happen, particularly in longer races. Uh, they have space to fill and that's an easy fallback on. So I hope someday we aren't in this position, but <laughs> it's definitely still there now. So I think maybe you and I just need to start commentating. We'll, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, <laughs> yeah. take the horn for the next Olympics. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's do that. Let's do that. And then we can, we can talk about other things. Um, yeah. We can have like a deep conversation with people like, whoa, whoa, whoa. These <laughs> two. I do not yeah. want to be hearing about like the, the meaning of life and uh, what they've learned about <laughs> purpose. I don't want to be thinking about that. Um, yeah. Although the other thing that gets me is, um, I genuinely believe now, which is not something I believed, although you may not have this perspective coming from the ultra world, 
but I guess you did come from the collegiate world. I genuinely think the, obviously there's a, a limit. You can't do this constantly. The energy you expend in high-fiving someone or smiling at someone gives you more energy than it takes to do that action, particularly with the high fives. Um, in my past, I would have never believed that. But that's the other thing that gets me with commentating is when it's not okay to, you're supposed to be focused. And I'm like, I, <laughs> you're sucking all the fun out of this sport. Like for that person, if they want to high five someone or they want to smile and stick their tongue out at someone, that's okay. Um, yeah. So we can sure have all the high fives and, and sticking tongues out aloud on our comment commentary. <laughs> yes, we, we would encourage it uh, for sure. Like, and, and I think if you're not having joy in what you're doing, mm. you know, tying back to early, your earlier question, you're really going to kind of deprive yourself of the experience and mm. it likely is not going to be a sustainable uh, feat for you. It's mm -hmm. like you, you need to find joy in the process somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, I know a lot of people talk about process versus outcome, like oriented work these days, but there's so much truth to that. Like if you're, mm -hmm. if you aren't able to find joy in what you're doing, it's not going to be a sustainable path, no matter what you're doing. So mm -hmm. if someone's criticizing you for high-fiving or, or even in the high school ranks, like don't kids are getting disqualified for celebrating mm -hmm. like at the finish line on <laughs> in track. It's like, this is, this, this is ridiculous. <laughs> like they, this is like their Olympic moment and you're like <laughs> robbing them of such a joyous thing. It's like, yeah, let them, let them be a little arrogant and, and like, you know, show boat because they earned it mm -hmm. it's um well uh, <laughs> and the reality is for the lot of the high school kids they're not going to get that in their collegiate and they're not going to get a professional life so why not let them mm -hmm. have it because someday this is going to be the good old days and yeah. yeah okay so did you reach a moment where this really hit you and you knew something needed to change or was this a gradual progression it was sort of a mixture Mm -hmm. Like throughout college, I knew I was doing things that were inappropriate and like I, I and I even saw a point where like I, I was, you know, starving myself to try to perform and it basically became like my fourth season in college, I was getting injured all the time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't making it to the end of the season. I wasn't performing the way I had, even though now my, my number was lower and it's, um, I think I then kind of like went through waves over the next decade as I kind of like was post collegiate racing on the roads and then eventually got into the trails, um, where there wasn't like a particular rock bottom or any like sort of moment where I was like, Oh God, like this is like, like there wasn't a single instance, but I, I actually got to the point where a lot of this stuff was bleeding over from my athletic career into just daily life where I was feeling mm -hmm. suffocated and I wasn't able to be present or show up at work or in relationships. And it just got to a point where I was really drowning in my own thoughts and I could not not fixate on food and calories and the way my body looked. And it, like, I just saw relationships starting to deteriorate uh, and I started to scare myself. I didn't see a future. It's like, and, and at that time I, I'd lost a friend, um, to suicide and then mm -hmm. a few friends to the mountains. And I really just started to kind of scare myself that like, I don't see a future living this way in my head. And that was what really pushed me to finally asking for help and, and reaching out and trying to, you know, figure out why I am trying to deal with all of this, you know, pain or hurt and anxiety in such a self-destructive way. Yeah. God, yeah. So much of that, that speaks to me. And, um, I mean, it's so hard living in your own, your own head with those thoughts constantly on top of, as you said, you know, not seeing a way through that. That's very scary. Um, I remember being, you know, trying to work, this was around maybe 2015, 2016, trying to do work during the day and let's say it'd be 3 PM and I'd be like, you cannot be hungry again. Um, I just gave you food like a few hours ago. Why are you hungry again? Why am I always hungry? I just ate lunch. And I'd be like, fine, I'll eat some carrots. And then I'd eat some carrots. And then I'd be like, I'm still hungry. Well, you're just going to have to wait till dinner because I'm not doing it right now. And 
And then, yeah, like that would involve going to look in the mirror and lifting my shirt up. And like, for me, my stomach was always my thing. And, and I just, I want to like bring my, my whatever age that was 26, 27 year old self. And like, just give her a little snow. Oh, just like, it's so hard being surrounded by those things and constantly wrestling with that or being, I don't know if you did this, but okay, I'm going out for dinner tonight. So I'm going to be really thoughtful with what I'm having today. So that if I, if I, you know, really enjoy myself tonight, then I can, uh, then I'm, then at least I'm not over it. And, um, and seeing runs as uh, only if I ran more than 10 miles, could I really eat what I wanted that day? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny it's how so the, you, you get this threshold where, in my mind, anything less than 70 minutes or 10 miles didn't count. It's kind of like, it, you know, you, you just get to that point, which is so ridiculous. Um, and yeah, when, when it becomes so fixated or you become so fixated and it's controlling, those thoughts are intrusive and mm. unwelcomed and debilitating. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, where you're really getting into that oppressive state of what, you know, a eating disorder or disordered eating mm -hmm. kind of uh, culture can, can do to a person. And I know for me, I got to the point where I just stopped. I started avoiding social situations. Mm -hmm. Like I, I couldn't handle going out to dinner, like for your very thing. Like I wouldn't even make it to dinner without losing my control or what I thought was control around food. So then I was too afraid to then go to dinner because I knew I was, I was already past my daily quota of calories and mm -hmm. going out would have just, you know, cause me even more anxiety. And, and so I, and I think, you know, personally that led to a lot of just withdrawal from society and from yeah. relationships. And, and then in that isolation, these thoughts we tell ourselves or the, the thoughts that automatically happen and that we latch onto, they're in an echo chamber that aren't checked with reality. And I think it's, it's easy for you then to just to really kind of drink your own story of mm. why the world is the way it is. And mm -hmm. it's not until you maybe give voice to these things that are threatening or, or that you're mm -hmm. fearful of that you kind of start to realize that once you change the way you see things, the things you see start to change. And I think that's a really important thing in terms of like taking a step forward, uh, you know, especially in like a, a you know, a, a food or body image type scenario, just kind of stripping yourself of those yeah. preconceived false narratives that have either been given to you or your, that you've written for yourself. Thank you to All Birds for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast and for supporting me in my journey. Today, I want to talk to you about the Women's Tree Dasher 2. Now, I will be wearing these as I start going through these major marathons where I work long days. When I was at the Chicago Marathon last year, I worked a 13 hour day, multiple days in a row, and I wore my Women's Tree Dasher 2 every day. They were incredibly comfortable. Even when I walked back into my hotel room late at night, I did not have any aches and pains. I love the amount of colors that they come in. Um, my favorite is definitely the Calm Cargo, which is kind of like a greeny colored. Um, as you know, I, I do love green as it is a nature color. Um, they are very comfortable. They have great stability. And of course, as it's all birds, they are passionate environmentally. They are doing the work. They are a B Corp and a highly rated B Corp at that. So that means they are doing what they need to do to be an environmentally sustainable company and relentlessly sticking to that. And so I encourage you to go check out the tree dashes if you have something for work, a work job that allows you to wear a pair of trainers or just for traveling for when you're on your feet for a lot of time or just day to day. You will often see me wearing these shoes. They are my go-to. And if you go to allbirds.com, you can go check them out. And also if you use the link in the show notes, you can get yourself a free pair of socks with your order. When you add those to your cart using that link in the show notes, go check it out at allbirds.com. Absolutely. And the judgments are like, you know, in, when you get to that state, you start judging other people for all their choices and thinking you're superior to them. <laughs> but those choices that you, you are judging them for, I mean, as, as the saying goes, right. To, uh, one finger at you, one finger at me to, two back at your, you or whatever that is. Um, and that's kind of the way it is, right? Like we're, we're judging other people for not making like healthy choices or taking care of your body. And you tell yourself these stories about why you're making the right choices and they're making the wrong ones, but really 
that just is more and more judgment on yourself. I want to move to what I, I, I want to um, save some room for some other things here. So what does running look like in this? Maybe you go by chapters, maybe not this Tim 2.0, this chapter 87 or wherever you are <laughs> in your uh, chapter of life. Um, or maybe you do it the other way. You're like chapter seven. Um, what, what is what is running and your relationship to it look like now? It's changed quite drastically over the last two years, and and a big focus or a big a big thing that has shifted is sort of my my desire to share the sport and the journey with other people and like give my time back to the sport and to the people involved. So I think there's an act of service and sort of community building that has really driven me. And you are and as selling my that, book right now. <laughs> uh, really? Okay. So <laughs> Everything you talked send, about today. So thank you. Send, send, send me a copy and I, I, will, will, uh, I will. I'll go ahead and start endorsing it. Um, continue, continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you for writing my book for me. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll scra um, I'll scratch out uh, and <laughs> Zoe and Tina and put an extra yeah. and in there. Um. <laughs> and I, I think it is, there's just some, like there's beauty in, in taking the focus off of yourself and mm. putting it onto someone else. And that in turn has allowed me to enjoy running again for the first time in, in decades, I would say like mm. truly enjoy it where I, I mean, running, as you mentioned, running was such a tool I had that was being used to manipulate my body or my food choices or try and acquire some status or acceptance or, you know, love in a, in a perceived tribe that I was chasing. And, and then I would find that if I didn't have a race on the calendar, if I didn't, if I was injured, I felt like I was hopeless. So there was like no reason for Like I wasn't going to run if I couldn't do these things. So I started recognizing mm -hmm. like my why that was driving everything was not sustainable. It wasn't a, a healthy why to build a foundation of love for the sport on. And, and so like now, as I kind of like shift that focus towards like serving our community or offering opportunities for people to do things that I had the fortune to do, it's allowed me to really re fall in love with running and appreciate what a gift running is mm -hmm. because just the act of running is a gift. And for so many years, I took that for granted. And I think just falling back in love with that process has been a, a, a joy. And, but I, at the same time, I find myself battling this thought that I've given up on my athletic aspirations myself mm. personally, because those, those seeds that were planted as an adolescent and like nurtured inappropriately for so many years are still there. And I have a hard time battling the thought that, oh, if I am not counting my calories or if I'm not weighing myself, do I even care about like elite performance? And, and I know the answer is, of course I do, but I have to challenge these automatic deep seated beliefs that I hold. And, and, and that's been a struggle, but it's something that I also am looking towards as a challenge that I think that as I confront those, those, you know, little mini demons that I have, it will allow me to then probably self-actualize and get the most out of what I have in the remaining year or two of my like pro career that I think I still have. And, and, uh, so that, that fills me with hope that there's still something out there to chase, but mm. it's, it's really just kind of redefining my relationship with the sport, which, you know, after being in it for 20 plus years, it's, it's a weird thing to kind of tackle. And it's, uh, but I guess, you know, you know, you're never too young to make, make a change or make an effort. So <laughs> I love that so much. And again, thank you for your vulnerability that this is not, and the whole point of what Zoe and I wrote was we chose the word becoming a sustainable runner, because as you just, just showed beautifully. And as we tried to show, like, there's no mountaintop that any of us look down from, like, I have this all figured out, or if you have, you might think you're at the top and you've got a, a pretty big fall coming soon. Yeah. Um, 
And so thank you for sharing that. Like there, that is something you still struggle with. And I struggled with that for many years. I actually really remember, uh, in 2021, I was guiding for a visually impaired runner. Oh no, I wasn't that year. Actually, I was just running it to run it, uh, the New York marathon. And I saw Grace and Murphy outside the hotel and she was like, mm -hmm. Oh, Hey, how are you doing? And I was like, Oh, I'm good. Um, and she was like, Oh, are you racing? And I was like, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm running and I felt so uncomfortable. Grayson is lovely and kind and sweet and not judgmental, but like in my head, I was like, oh, she's thinking like, what a waste of like, what a waste of a race you, mm -hmm. you, you know, like I just, I was judging myself through her eyes, even though I had no idea what she was thinking. Yeah. And actually I could tell she was just like, that's amazing. Um, but yeah, it, it takes many years to process through that. I actually feel like I finally reached that point. And actually this ties into you because I was at Havelina, uh, a few weeks ago <laughs> and I was supposed to be running the hundred K, uh, my first hundred K. Um, and I got a Haglin. Do you know what Haglin's deformity is? Oh yeah. Oh, a nasty, Which, uh, nasty. On both the heels I've or got one? It on one. Although I've been told that if you've got it on one, it's it, probably coming in the other one. It, okay, Tina, have you been wearing super shoes? No, I will never wear a <laughs> pair of those shoes ever. I am very, very against them. We Why? could have a separate podcast on that. Like, yes, you we and need I, to talk I, about I, that piece. Yeah. Have you had a Haglins? <laughs> We have had I have not, but I, I've worked with a lot of patients that have, and we're seeing it more and more in the last couple in of years. Yeah. Shoes? Yep. Oh, interesting. Well, that's not good, is it? All right. Well, now I have another thing to push people off buying super shoes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I got a hag lens deformity, and um, for the last three or four months, I averaged about 25 miles a week, which I haven't averaged even with my time off when I quit, even with my two pregnancies and postpartums, I have not done since I was 15 years old. And I stood on, uh, of when I watched the 100 milers go, I was crewing Ryan. I felt so proud of Ryan and all he'd worked mm -hmm. through to be there. And then I watched the 100K go. And I, uh, Rachel Norfleet, I was also, you know, she was in the same tent as us, a friend of mine. I just felt pride, proud for, uh, I felt pride for her. I did not feel like, oh, what a waste. Oh, I should be out there. Oh, I wish I was running more. And I've really feel like for me, I finally reached that place of peace of like, I can be running 30 miles a week and I'm okay with it, which I wish I was running more. I look forward to getting back to two to three hour trail runs, but it feels good. <laughs> To be like, if I can run hard, if I can train hard, great. If I can't, it is what it is. So, yeah, um, that's, yeah that's so beautiful. And yeah. I mean, that just, that speaks to your level of self comfort, mm -hmm. acceptance and mm -hmm. self peace that you've granted mm -hmm. yourself. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's a, a beautiful way of highlighting that that state is something we should strive for mm. more than like achieving a shiny PR or, mm -hmm. you know, a BQ. I, I don't know. Like if you can't celebrate in other people's success, I think it speaks a lot to where you are personally mm -hmm. and probably some insecurity that is, you know, that you should probably face where yes. someone else's, you know, achievement isn't at odds with your ability to, to do something like Absolutely. it's not mutually exclusive. And I know I was, I, I had similar things just in the last year, like watching Western States last year, mm -hmm. genuinely being excited for every single finisher and not feeling that sense of insecurity of like, oh, like, I like you, but don't do too well. Yeah. Like, you know, it's <laughs> yes. kind of like, and, yes. and so it, it's that. really nice to be in that spot where you're like, okay, like, no, this is celebrating others is a beautiful thing. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's going to allow you just more comfort in your own life. Yes. No, I, I, <laughs> It's, it's a good feeling and it doesn't mean that you can't try that. That for me, I think is the next stage of how do I get back to trying without, um, with this stage of my life with kids and a 35 year old body, not a 20 year old body, um, as well as, um, not getting wrapped up in those old things again, falling into those same patterns. So, uh, I know I'm not at the end of the road, but it feels good to be here. I do want to talk about CIM. Uh, it's coming up uh, very soon. And um, 
you have run it many times. You've also paced the women's groups many times and uh, most likely will be again this year. Is that one of the things you referred to when you said about acts, like giving back to the community? Was that one of the things you meant by that? That has been uh, a component. A, I've really enjoyed being able to to pace and watch other people realize their dreams. And, mm. and it also is, I mean, selfishly, it works really well. My wife has been in that kind of like oh, Olympic amazing. trials qualifying group. And so I will run with her and a group of 30 or 40 other women. And so it's, it's really fun to be able to see mm. that like unfold. And um, so that, that has been a, a degree where, yeah, I've kind of let go of my maybe personal um, like focus on the roads and just being like, okay, where can I use my fitness to help others? Um, mm. and, and so, and CIM, it's something that's so close to, uh, both Lindsay and my heart that it's, it's like our hometown local marathon. And we run for the Sacramento, Sacramento running a safe association that puts on the race with Scott yeah. and, uh, and Danielle, and it's just a great organization. So if I'm not running pacing like i've driven the dropout van for the elites mm. before and and you know i've i've worked at aid stations i think i've been there almost you know, every year for the last 15 plus years and so it's just it's a weekend we we absolutely love it wow. on the west coast cim is california's boston you know it, it's yeah. not it doesn't have the history it doesn't have the crowds <laughs> but like for the locals here it's something we care about equally mm. as much and so mm -hmm. it's fun for us to be able to show up and see our friends and and just have that you know december early december party okay i want to go into a bit more of that in a second but first i'm confused is mammoth lakes near sacramento <laughs> um well, I oh, guess in, so California is a big state um, yes. <laughs> and uh, we are not near, we're four and a half okay. hours away. Okay. Okay. And, I was um, like, I swear it's not that good. Okay. But yeah, explain yeah. to me what you meant then by like a hometown. So my, <laughs> I was, I was, I went through middle school and high school in the Sacramento suburbs. Mm -hmm. And then I went to, okay. um, undergraduate up at Chico state, which is only right. 90 minutes away from Sacramento. Mm. And that's also where my wife was born and raised. And then we lived in Sacramento for a number of years when I was in grad school. So I went okay. to Sac state and okay. at that time we started running with the local Sacramento, mm. Sacramento running association. So we joined their club about a decade ago. And when we relocated to mammoth, we just kind of kept our ties where I anyone that. that runs in the Northern California area knows that there's this association called the Pacific association for USATF. And it's mm -hmm. a very competitive like road, cross country and track circuit for all ages, for youth, uh, post-collegiate and master super masters veterans. And so we've just kind of stuck with our club in that sense. And so CIM is our home away from home, even though mm. we currently live four hours away. Yes. No, that makes sense. And, uh, and yeah, you've had plenty of history there then in, for that reason. I left in Philadelphia for two years and I still feel like there's a piece of me left there. Um, yeah. and I was only there for two years. So I, I get that. And you've spent a lot more time than that what, for someone who hasn't run, uh, I should say California international marathon for anyone who's wondering, <laughs> or keep saying CIM, um, you know, maybe someone's heard like, Oh, that's a fast, fast race or the ultimate one is, oh, that's a downhill race, which got me big time in <laughs> when I did it. Um, because I want to say loud and clear, it is not just a straight, slow downhill. It's rolling hills. It is downhill, but it does have some rollers in there. So make sure you prepare for that. Not that it's a bit too late for people at this point, but <laughs> for next year. Um, for someone who doesn't really know much about that race, what what is it for you that makes it special? Probably the things that make it particularly special is just the intimate feeling you get mm -hmm. despite being a larger city marathon. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I have great love for the majors and I've run a lot of them, but something like CIM, it reminds me a lot of grandmas, if anyone's run that, where it's, it's this like very... Like it, it is just a group of such passionate people in the community that are putting on this event and they welcome you to their, to their, you know, town with the open arms. And you feel that from the ex, from the expo to the bus shuttles, like up to the start line, you just have all these touch points where you're interacting with the community and the other runners and you feel that warm energy from the race organization. And so I think it's 
like mirroring that with more of a large city marathon, it kind of gives you the best of both worlds where you feel like you're part of this like VIP club, but you're also running like a, a really professionally organized event. And it's, yeah, it's, that's probably what draws me to it the most. Mm -hmm. And then I have always been more of a, like a strength based runner. I loved cross country. I hated the track. And so of course, like CIM, I feel like, like, you know, offers something that's more challenging, where, as you said, it's billed as a downhill marathon. But if you look at the course profile, it's kind of like a death of 10,000 cuts. There are all these mm -hmm. little rollers and those mm -hmm. rollers really get you. And, and they're even more than rollers. There's some like proper hills mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. And if you're expecting that it's just going to be downhill for 26 miles, you'll be rudely awakened when <laughs> your hamstrings and quads are shot. <laughs> You yes, know, with, six, yes. with 10K to go and you can't yes. run the pancake flat <laughs> finish line for four miles. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so I, I just like how it, you know, it feels like you're on a little roller coaster the whole way. Like, you know, it uses your body in different ways. It, you, know, you run through a bunch of little communities and the, the fan support is fantastic. So I think it's just... It, it's something close to my heart. And, and then also I've run, I have run my best times there. And so yeah, me too. that, that always, that always feels good. Like you have good memories about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's one of the like best marathons in the country for sure. Mm, absolutely. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, so I take it, you're going to ask them about us rolling out our pilot program for the, uh, commentating. <laughs> yes. I, I, I actually just texted Scott and he said, yep, you guys are on the lead vehicles. You're going to, you're going to post up and we're going to be live streaming. So I love it. <laughs> yeah. Book your ticket. Yes. Book your ticket. This is, this is where it all began. Um, be like, move over in BC. This is, through. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yes. So, and, uh, on that note, so yeah, both Tim and I will be, will be there that weekend. If you are running, be sure to let us know. Um, I will be around the expo on and off, um, during the two days before and you will be where? I will. Around. Let's see. Um, I will be at the expo probably on Friday, but then okay. Saturday I won't be around. Um, the trail world has kind of a holiday Western States lottery occurs. And oh, so yeah, it does. I will be at Auburn for the lottery <sighs> and then, but I'll be back around all Sunday for the race, either pacing women or drive, driving a van or handing out water cups. I, I, I need to that. talk to Scott and see, see where they need, <laughs> need me most, but it's probably going to be running with the women. Yes. Um, I mean, not many people can be like, yeah, if they need me, I'll just jump in and pace the Olympic Charles qualifying pace. Um, just like that. But, um, I love that so much. And, uh, uh, I kind of did a similar thing. So I said, I haven't run more than 25 miles. I've been running 25 miles a week. And then I did New York with Kaylee, which was 26 miles, um, in one go. Um, <laughs> but we, <laughs> we were, you know, obviously walking most of the way and that's where my body can handle that because mm -hmm. of the years of training I could so far I have got away with that, um, that experience, uh, unscathed, but yes, that's one of the gifts we have of those years of training, um, and just an ability that you can kind of do things like that. So I love that you're using it to, to support other people. Is there anything else you would like to remind the listeners based on what we've talked about today or any just parting words you want to share? Ooh, um, I think in general, just, we all need to be kinder to ourselves, mm -hmm. it, which is a very hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, practicing that self-love or self-acceptance is, is I struggle with it daily, but the moments that I find it clicks and like my, what I'm doing aligns with what my true values are. It's so much more rewarding and life feels richer. And I just, you know, would encourage people to be kind with yourself because mm -hmm. you're never going to have it perfect. It's, you know, everything is a process as you mentioned. And, you know, you, there's not some mountaintop where you hit and you, now you're the sustainable runner or now you're the, you know, you know, you have a great relationship with food or now you're, you know, fill in the blank. I think it's just embracing our imperfections and realizing that, those aren't inadequacies, but rather celebrate what makes you unique and, you know, just lean into that self-love. And that that's probably all I would say. I love that so much. Thank you so much, Tim. It has been such a joy to talk to you and get to know you. Um, I appreciate all that you do. The conversations you're having around mental health are 
critically important. And um, I can't wait to see where your journey takes you next. So thank you for sharing. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Tina. Before we go any further, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Running For Real team. Without them, I would not be able to do barely anything compared to what I'm able to do today. They are behind the scenes. They are there for me. I am just so appreciative of them. To Jeremy Nessel, our podcast editor, audio consultant, and someone who's been with me since the start. To Sally Pontarelli, our content and operations manager, who is there day to day doing all the things to help me be successful. To Kelsey Wang, our head of design, and Louise Murphy, our associate designer. And finally, to Sandy Gutierrez, our photographer and content strategist, I am appreciative of all of you and wouldn't be able to do what I do without you. I really enjoyed that conversation with Tim. As I said, we jumped in a bit quick into a deep conversation, but a very powerful one. And I hope this has been helpful for you um, and maybe made you think differently about your own choices and and taking steps to help yourself if this, this is something that you've been working through. So be sure to go find him in the show notes. I've got links to all of his pages where you can go find him. Also his race, Mammoth Trail Fest. Be sure to go check that out in the show notes, along with the links to our sponsors, which will be in the show notes. So you can check out Precision, get that 15% off. AG1, you can get that free one-year supply of vitamin D3 and K2. (laughs) Struggling to speak there. And also to Allbirds, you can get that free pair of socks with your order by going to runningforreal.com forward slash episode 378. There are all the links in there. Remember, it's holiday time. Becoming a sustainable runner is an ideal thing to put on your holiday list. Uh, You can find it on all the usual retailers wherever you buy your books. And you can also find it on Amazon worldwide as well as on Audible. Thank you so much for listening, my friends. I will see you next week. Thank you.